مساء الخير. Right now we're going to talk about passive verbs in Arabic. Verbs that we take and put into the passive voice. And in Arabic that construction is called الفعل المبني للمجهول or sometimes just المبني للمجهول. Now in English if you had a normal North American high school English experience you may have been taught that the passive voice is something to be avoided. It's not considered good style. In Arabic, the same prohibition doesn't really exist, and we see the passive voice all the time, especially in journalistic and um, expository texts. So it is something that we need to know how to use. Here is a chart with all of the passive forms in the past tense, al-madi, and the present tense, al-mudara. You'll notice, I've voweled them in blue, that the vowels are pretty much the only thing that changes, which means that in an unvocalized text, in one where we don't have all of the diacritical marks, we'll need to think very carefully about what the subject of a verb could be. Is the subject doing something, or is the subject having something done to it? in the passive voice. In terms of the mechanics of how the passive voice works, you'll notice that in the past tense and the present tense, all of these verbs, which are conjugated for huwa, the masculine singular, start with a bamma, not as you might expect a fatha, uh, which is true in most of the passive voice conjugations. In the past tense, we have first a bamma and then a kasra on the second to last letter of the judr, the three letter root of the word. So, for example, if we wanted to take darasa, he studied and put it into the passive, he or it was studied. <coughs> we would, instead of saying darasa, fatha, 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 say du. Risa. In the present tense, the bamma that's attached to the conjugation prefix is followed with fathas on all of the other syllables until we might get to one of the suffix endings to conjugate for a particular person. All of the conjugation prefixes and suffixes remain the same. So, for example, I could say the book was studied, durisa. Al-Kitab, or we could say the article was studied instead. Article is Maqala, which is feminine, so I'm going to take the same vowels that I use for the passive tense, but conjugate it in the feminine. So I get Du Reset Al-Maqala. If it helps, you can think of the chorus to the horrible old song, oo, e, oo, a, a. In the past, our vowels are always oo, e first, and then in the present tense, the first vowels that we're going to hear are oo and a. If it doesn't help, don't go listen to that song. Just don't. Um, in the couple of cases where the structure of the wazn, the verb pattern, gives us extra syllables, in the past tense, we slip an extra bamma in there. So in form 10, for example, where we have a lot of extra letters, it becomes ustuf'ila, where we have two dhammas, instead of istaf'ala in the passive voice. Um, if we want to say, the computer was used, We would vowel it ustuhdima al computer with a sukun in the same places as in the passive voice. Note again that without these vowels, we would not be able to tell necessarily whether the verb was 
passive or active. If I saw this and I read it, I could think either, hmm, this is conjugated for who was, so is there a subject that I don't know about? Who is this person who used the computer? He used the computer, active voice. Or maybe, hmm, the computer was used. Ustuhdima al computer. It's up to me to know from the context of the rest of a text whether I'm using the active or passive voice. You'll notice that for a lot of verbs, in the passive voice, we only really have to worry about inanimate subjects being used, having the passive voice applied to them. Computers, books, articles. There are a few verbs that we can use in the passive voice for people, one of which you probably know already, uh, the verb for being born. Most students of Arabic learn the passive voice before they learn the active voice. Wulida means to be born. I could say, Wulid tu fi Wisconsin. I was born in Wisconsin. But in the active voice, the same verb, walada, means to give birth. So it's important not to mix these up, right? If I say waladtu fi Wisconsin, that means that I gave birth in Wisconsin, which is a very different kettle of fish, is it not? A couple of other things to remember or to notice, in Form 7 and Form 9, we don't really have a passive conjugation. And there are good reasons for that. Number one, Form 7 already has the meaning of taking an active verb and making it passive. Another way of saying durisa al-kitab would be to say instead indarasa al-kitab. And those extra letters that make it a Form 7 verb give it a passive meaning. The book was studied. So if we took indarasa and put it into this pattern with a dhamma at the beginning, and a kasra before the final letter of the judr, it would almost have a doubly passive meaning that would be too much. It would be uh, passive to the point of meaninglessness, basically. And Form 9 verbs, if you go and study the Form 9 video, or if you've used them or seen them or heard about them, tend to have the meaning of being or becoming something, uh, especially being or becoming, gaining a physical quality turning green or being blonde. So if we made that verb passive, it would become a little too recursive. It wouldn't really have a meaning that made any sense. Let's look at a couple more examples. In the present tense, uh, there's a verb in form eight that you hear kind of like wulida, very, very often in the passive voice. There's a verb, i'tabara, which means to consider or to believe to be something. So we could say, Naji mahfuz is considered among the most important writers of the last century. In a case like that, we would do this. That's a long sentence. I'm not going to complete it, but vocalized it would say, it would be pronounced يُعْتَبَرْ نَجِيْ محفوظ مِنْ أَهَمْ كُتَّاب الْقَرْنَ الْمَاضِي Notice here that we can infer from the context that Najib محفوظ is the subject of this passive verb. If we interpret it as an active verb, we would have to say, okay, Najib محفوظ considers among the most important writers, and very quickly the logic of the sentence would kind of 
break down. The most important thing to remember about passive verbs, again, is that we typically aren't going to see the vowel markings in a text. Sometimes a book or an article, if they're using a passive voice, they will, sometimes an editor or an author will be kind and give you that information. And it's really nice when they do that. It's not unheard of. It is one of those rare cases where you might see vowel markings in a text. But as a reader, you really, really, really cannot count on that being the case. So it's very important to track the subjects in your sentences. Sometimes if a sentence doesn't seem to make sense with an active voice, it may be that a verb is passive. That's a skill that comes with time. But for the moment, recognize that they're out there and keep careful track of the subjects of your sentences.